Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here, wherever it is that you have pulled up to on this beautiful Monday morning. I am your host, the great Brian Last, and joining me on the line, the man who will be answering your questions like he does each and every week. From Louisville, Kentucky, Mr. Jim Cornette. The star of our show of Jim Cornette's drive Through, featuring the great Brian Last. See how much more up I am after my holiday break, Brian. It's 2020. We're doing these new programs with a renewed sense of vigor and purpose, excitement, energy. We've got all kinds of things for the people on the programs coming up. It's it's going to be exciting. See what a little rest will do for somebody. When you wring your brain out, and then it starts absorbing knowledge again. What? That's the sound of a brain being wrung out. Have you never heard that before? I, I've never heard it, but the little sucking sound at the end, I'll probably have to edit out. It was pretty disturbing. <laughs> but no, that, that certainly has been noticeably more energy from you in the last two episodes of both the experience and the drive through that we have put up in the last week. Yes, it's amazing. When I sleep a couple times a week, what uh, what happened? And I'll tell you something else right here at the top of the program. I'll tell you something else that's helping me out because normally we tape this program in the morning time and and it's fucking freezing cold here now. It's been hot and cold and hot and cold. You know, the weather all over the country. Everybody's weather is miserable because of the goddamn Republicans. And it, with all this change in the weather, I, I never know whether I get up in the morning, whether it's going to be freezing or whether it's going to be warm or whether it's going to be raining or whatever. And my hip is killing me and my shoulder's killing me. And we've been talking about it on the program. The Omax cryo freeze is I am I'm I'm cry, I'm walking around cryo froze most of the time because it's the only thing that makes me feel better, especially in this fucking shitty weather. Um, it it it. it for whatever reason, it just comes on, especially when it's wet and it's cold, the arthritis in the knees, the bad hip, the shoulder, whatever the case, the aches and pains. If you take the Omax cryo freeze, if you get the roll on and you roll it on, it's great. But the fucking, we've talked about it, the the, the sports cream or whatever is incredible. Even my achy uh, cartilage lists knees uh, in this weather, if you r- roll that on or rub it on, within a couple minutes, it, it doesn't stink like icy hot, but it, at the same time, it gives you that cold freeze and it takes the ache away. It worked for Stacy's mom, who's had a knee replacement and a hip replacement. It's uh, They've got all this scientific fucking data here about... Um, <laughs> Is that what I hear in the background? You're yeah, well, I'm handling this, all the data? It, It's got therapeutic menthol, CBD, pain relief ingredients, elevates pain relief endocannabinoids. It's got joint support. It's all natural, and it's anti-inflammatory. And and face it, most of the fucking aches and pains you have are inflammatory. So if you can anti-inflammatory those, you're ahead of the game. Anyway, because this is a miracle product here, uh, you you can use it again and again four times a day. Although I may push that sometimes. Um, but if you go to omaxhealth.com and enter the code DRIVE for the drive through, see what we did there, then you get 20% off everything the cryo freeze, but everything on the site. Omaxhealth.com, enter the code DRIVE, 20% off of everything. And it, it, from sore muscles to, to old people's problems. And I've got all of them. It, it'll fix you up. I've been using the rapid relief drops they sent me. It's like a little dropper and you, you know, get some of the oil and you just put it in your mouth and rapid Stace, relief. Stace got those and I haven't, I, or that, and I haven't seen it since. I don't know what happened. It, it, my <laughs> stuff keeps disappearing. Well, and your family took yours because this is good shit. Yeah, I didn't get the cream. They took the cream. They took the cream. Well, the cream always rises to the top. They took the cream. Last heard in Dallas, 1983. The Freebird cream. <laughs> no, they didn't use the Freebird cream in Dallas. They used it in New Orleans. Hold on. What did they use to, when Buddy Roberts lost his hair? It wasn't the cream? Didn't he just get his head shaved as part of a stipulation? No, no. It was, it was huh? the Freebird cream, I believe. Ah, well... You never know about these things. Because <laughs> I, wa- I wasn't there. It was Owen. I wasn't even there. 
That is quickly becoming your favorite catchphrase, isn't it? Well, because a lot of times I I wasn't there and I don't have any knowledge of it. Um, I'll tell you what, you know, I mentioned to you before we went on the air here, I had an untold story and I realized this was untold because I just met with John Cosper, my friend up here in Louisville that did the Bluegrass Brawlers book and he's done so much research on the history of Louisville wrestling in general and and um, he's written a number of books, the the Black Panther book that just came out. Anyway, he's doing Tracy Smothers' book. And we were talking about Tracy and and the Southern Boys and the match we had with him in WCW, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, after the fact, I thought of, I don't know if I've told this story. It hadn't been in the last 10 or 15 years. I'll, I'll give, it, give it the ultimate test. If you haven't heard this story, I haven't told it in a long, long fucking time. Do you know if we had, if me and Stan Lane had not walked out of WCW at the end of October, what we were going to be doing in November and December of 1990 in WCW? I don't recall, no. Well, there you go. Then I've done it. I've come up with a story I hadn't told before. Um, it, it, I don't want to go into the whole end of WCW, you know, year in thing. We've done that on the deep dives and all that stuff. And everybody knows that I was not happy at Halloween Havoc and blah, blah, blah. But before the last of October, I had gone to, because one of the biggest bones of contention was, was the fact that the midnight, every, we were booked on house shows and we were getting beat every night, but we were hardly ever on television. If we were on television, it was also to get beat, but we weren't even on TV that much. We were still getting paid, obviously. That was the, that was the problem in WCW at that time. That was the first era, the first year, really, year or two years, where everybody in the company got paid on guaranteed contracts and never made any more. <laughs> and that didn't make any less, but you didn't make any more. It didn't matter what you drew. It didn't matter how big the house was, how big the pay-per-view was. You knew what you were going to fucking get, and that's what you were going to get. And that, to me, was the start of the death of the wrestling business. Because all of those guys at that time had had to work as hard as they could and scratch and claw and, and fucking stab people in the back and beat themselves up and, and work hard to get over, to get in the main events, to fucking draw, to make money. And all of a sudden now they're getting it for free. They're like, fuck, I put my dues in. That's why everybody that got a hangnail was taking a check for WCW to sit home, right? Except the few people on the roster with work ethics, such as the Midnight Express. Um, and it was before this generation or the more modern generation, they, when they got in the business, they had the opportunity to be stars and they were going to beat themselves up regardless of what money they were making. If they were on a guaranteed contract, that's fine. They'd never made big money. They'd never been stars. They wanted to be stars. They're going to kill themselves regardless of what the fuck. So that's why there was that 10 year period where you had a lot of the veterans that were doing as little as they possibly could in a fucking ring and collecting the checks. And you had the guys making much less money because they hadn't been stars yet, that were fucking literally killing themselves to get over, regardless of whether getting over led to being a bigger draw and being in bigger matches and making more money. They weren't going to make any more money. They didn't care. They just wanted to be stars. So it was a fucking anyway. I knew that if they just would put the Midnight Express on television, because we stayed over in the houses. At that point in time, the Midnight Express, Ric Flair... Lex Luger and Sting were the last, you know, guys left from the glory period that people remembered where NWA and Jim Crockett Promotions was great and drawn big crowds. And the Midnight were good enough in the ring that they stayed up. Even if we did the house show match and did the fucking job in the third match, it was still a great match. And, and they still had, the people still had confidence in the Midnight Express. Every time that they would do something with us, it would get over because people almost at that point, we've talked about it, were like, oh, good, they're going to push him again, right? It's like, oh, thank God. <clears throat> but anyway, the, the the only way they could kill us was just keeping us off television where nobody saw us to begin with, right? So I had gone to, I, I, I couldn't go to Ole with an idea for what to have for lunch because he would shoot it down because he knew that Hurd didn't want to fucking use us. He didn't want to die on that hill. 
So I had gone to Jim Ross, who I knew could put a word in and pitch something to get the midnight and me at least back on television over the last few months of 1990. And the, basically, the I don't remember the twists and turns, but the gist of it was, remember, they had just signed El Gigante, Jorge Gonzalez, poor old Jorge. And what, he was from Argentina. They'd signed him for the Atlanta Hawks because he was seven feet seven. But it, it, he was a great basketball player because he was seven feet seven, but he wasn't a great basketball player for the fucking NBA, right? So they made him a wrestler because they had him under contract. And the first time I saw him, me and Jim Ross were walking in for a booking meeting into CNN Center. And this fucking guy is sitting there in one of the, the like the Omni Hotel was in the complex, right? And in the lobby, one of the lobby chairs, big overstuffed hotel lobby chair. He was so tall, his knees were over his head because his feet were flat on the floor when he was sitting in his fucking chair. <laughs> And JR said, well, there's our new giant, right? So anyway, they had used him that summer, and they remember I want the belt and the claw and the whole thing. I'd gone to JR. I said, look, they want to get this fucking giant over, right? The midnight at this point, if, if we are on television, it's just to do a job, but we're barely on television. I said, let's do something to get the giant over. And they weren't doing anything with the Southern boys at that time. That's how I've come to think of this. Tracy Smothers and Steve Armstrong. At the bash that year in Baltimore, we had had what every newsletter and everybody voted as the tag team match of the year. It still stands up today. It's one of the best Midnight Express matches of that period on, on tape because so many of the house shows weren't taped. But the 90 bash against the Southern boys, the people in Baltimore wanted to see the fucking Southern boys waving the Confederate flag and coming out to the generic choo-choo music because they couldn't <laughs> use any goddamn real music. They wanted to see them like they wanted to see their mother hooked up to a machine, right, when they came out. And then we came out, we got a pop, even though we're the heels, because, oh, my God, it's the Midnight Express, it's the Northeast, and at least they used to be good, right? So... But the match we had with them, because Tracy and Steve, they were good, they were hungry, they were eager. We'd worked out a, a few things that that got over in house shows when we did it with them, and it just it clicked, and it was an excellent match, right? And we had, of course, in because of that, actually, I think been in the ring with them about three more times in, in house shows in fucking farmland Indiana or whatever. So... I asked JR, I said, let's do something where we fuck the Southern boys over and the giant comes to save them. And then give us a month and let us win a few matches on television and let me cut promos. And let and then the Southern boys want to get revenge and blah, blah, blah. And finally we do a clash or a pay-per-view, some high-profile match. We do the six-man that I get hornswoggled into and I'll take the big slam from the giant. Boom. And, this, and you know, that was, <laughs> I was like, fuck, that was, I, that was hard to force that one out of my mouth. Because the last thing I wanted to do was take a body slam from that giant fuck. He wasn't a bad person, but good God, right? Anything could happen. He's fucking eight feet tall. But that was the selling point of the thing. Basically, put me in the Midnight Express and the Southern Boys back on television so they can show how good they are, and I'll talk the fucking giant over and take the bump for him. There is no other finish for a six-man like that. I have to take the bump for the giant. And JR liked it. Okay, so back then they used to do the booking and give the booking sheets out at, at least a month in advance, even though the guys still often wouldn't come. Nominally, the card was down. And so I'm thinking that, okay, we're going to, get some, you know, indication of, of what's going to go on on television during the month building period or the six weeks or whatever, where we're on TV, we're getting some wins, we're cooking and we're talking about the giant and then we're going to build for this big match. <laughs> and I think it was like the, the week before the final blow up at Halloween Havoc, I get the booking sheets and they've agreed to do part of it. There's the goddamn... They've skipped the part where we spend a month trying to get the the issue and, and the Midnight Express back over and both teams back on television. I just see immediately after, starting in what Halloween Havoc was October 27, right? So starting the first week of November, 
and go into the clash of champions in the middle of November is the Midnight Express against the Southern Boys, but more importantly, half of the matches are already the six-man. We're going to do like five house show matches with the Southern Boys, and then we're going to, which we're probably going to lose, and then they not only book the Clash of Champions, but also like fucking Poughkeepsie, uh, Rome, Georgia, wherever the fuck, six-mans with the Giant. I'm going to be taking this goddamn body slam every night of the fucking week. <laughs> Flashbacks of Little John. <laughs> yes. Yes. And as I had just absorbed what the fuck, they completely bypassed the point where we actually spend a month making anybody care about whether it happens or not, and immediately it's booked. And then we go to Halloween Havoc, where we did the job. We, we were supposed to open with the Rock and Roll Express, but uh, Robert had got hurt, hurt his knee. So we opened the show back before it was fashionable to do that with a hot match. It was the fucking curtain jerker. And we put over Ricky Morton and Tommy Rich the first time they'd ever teamed because the Southern boys come out and interfere and fucking distract us, as I recall. And then the Southern boys go out and work with the Freebirds. And I go out and in the Confederate general uniform and fuck with them and the Freebirds beat them. <laughs> And then they strip my fucking uniform off and fucking spank me. That's the way we're going to start this hot program. Both teams got beat and the manager got beat up on the same show. And now for the next fucking however long, we're going to get the giant involved in it. And I'm going to be thrown into this thing and taking fucking eight foot body slams every night in goddamn Rome, Georgia. And that's another reason why we said, fuck you. And But I had never thought about that until just starting to think about Tracy's. He's doing a book on his entire life and career, and it's, it's, it has to be amazing. But, but yeah, we would have been – finally would have got the chance to work with the Southern Boys uh, so that we could be beaten some more. <laughs> and, and fuck it. And so I, I saved it, and, and I know – that somebody was going to want that fucking giant to choke slam me rather than body slam me. And there would have been a goddamn issue there too. Much like when at Halloween havoc, when Ole wanted to, to fucking bust the pumpkin over my head, not even break it over my head, put the jack-o'-lantern on my head. So I'd walk around with a fucking jack-o'-lantern pumpkin on my head. <laughs> and no, we won't be doing that either. Ole. Was that the night that Paul Lee was dressed like a vampire? Yes. <laughs> yes, he, that's a night he, he didn't. He actually didn't have time to rent a costume, so he just came from home as he was. And <laughs> well, that's not fair because he was so orange during those years <laughs> with makeup. I wouldn't say he looked like a vampire naturally. What is it about? Well, I'm just talking about the blood sucking aspect. <laughs> of it, but, but but what what was it? What is it about people from New York that have orange skin? Is it the fucking pollution in the air? No, it's the TBS makeup team. Well, I don't know. Hey, Terry Runnels was a, a very good young makeup lady at that point in time. She just needed something to work with that didn't require a trowel. <laughs> Paul's face, my God, it's put together like a fucking ransom note. There's, 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 it looks like there was extra parts left over from somebody else. They just put different fucking sections on some of his face. How did we get into you? Paul? <laughs> I don't know. Building you know up what? this program, there's going to be no resolution to. Well, I'm telling you, here's the thing. Now that I've said that, you may want to take this out because I know Paul. Paul is very litigious. And Paul Heyman, unlike me, and by the way, we're going to reveal a little known fact about me this week on the experience, a little known fact that that is is hitherto been unknown about me. We're going to reveal that on this week's experience. But unlike me, Paul Heyman will sue a motherfucker in a heartbeat. And I know if he needed to sue me, I know he is so devious. He is so devious. I know exactly who he'd call. Call Stephen P. show or two. He'll the rest.
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Heyman is the only person I can think of that would be underhanded enough to sue a son of a bitch and hire his own attorney and one of his best friends at the boot to do it. But Stephen P. knew, I know as an honorable man, it would not take that case. Would you not agree, Brian Last? There's no way that Stephen P. knew would represent Paul Heyman in a defamation suit against James E. Cornette. Well, I don't think he's allowed to. I think that would be a conflict of interest considering his representation of you. You think that Paul Heyman has never worked with anybody that there was a conflict of interest about before? I, 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 why no, I don't think, I think Stephen P. New wouldn't <laughs> violate that more than Paul would I, violate that. I know. I just wanted to make sure you were listening. No, Stephen P. New, <laughs> the only thing that he will violate is the people that have wronged you. The people that have wronged you, the people that have harmed you, the people that have been negligent against you or your family or your friends or your social circle, Stephen P. New will violate them in ways that even German videos have never thought of before, ladies and gentlemen. Stephen P. New will be all up in their business, and he'll tromp around with muddy feet because Stephen P. New is the hammer of justice, the baron of the barristers, the consigliere of the cult of Cornet, and what's more, He's going to be a guest this week on the program where we talk about how he is already, it's almost a shutout. He is already handling my recent well-documented legal issues with people trying to rip me off. He's already knocking them out of the park there. We're going to talk about that this Thursday. But if you need help, if you need assistance, if you need anyone to represent you in court in the legal arena, the legal coliseum where we separate the Lions from the Christians, or in this case, from the cult members, you call Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084, or newlawoffice.com. If you need to sue, call Stephen P. New. That's exactly right. And before people start suing us, Jim, we have some questions here. <laughs> what, for, for misrepresenting ourselves as a show? That's right. For saying this is a question and answer show and never getting to the questions, but... A lot of questions, a lot of hot button issues in professional wrestling. And I have to say, I don't know if we've ever received as many questions for the drive through about something that happened the day before as we have about what I'm going to call the Tessa Blanchard controversy. OK, so well, all I have and, and you know, I, I just turned on because I actually separated myself from the outside world early yesterday. That's one of the reasons why I'm feeling so chipper, because I'm having much less contact with people in the outside world. So I briefly turned on the Twitter this morning uh, before we started recording just to see what was going on. And now all the girls in the business are just hopping on Tessa Blanchard for something that she tweeted saying we should all support everyone. And now, now they're just all hopping on her. Is this correct? This is correct. I, I consider it somewhat similar to imagine if you just said, hey, why can't we all just get along? Why do we yeah. have no problems with each other? And then people said, what the fuck? But anyway, uh, one of the questions that came in on Twitter using a hashtag corny drive through from James Cotto. Nice to see that Jim isn't in the middle of a Twitter firestorm for a change. Will you be discussing this on the drive through And then another question here from Matt Quick, hashtag corny drive through on Twitter. What are your thoughts on the allegations that Tessa Blanchard spit in a female African-American wrestler's face? Called her the N-word at a show in Japan. Does this change your view of Tessa? And obviously there are lots of other questions. And like you said, there was a pile on all these various women from various companies, various independent organizations came out. It seems that everyone has a horror story all of a sudden about Tessa Blanchard. And it probably wouldn't have come well, out if she hadn't tweeted, hey, why can't, why can't we all get along? Why can't we all support each other as women? <laughs> Well, if it all of us, why hasn't it come out before all of a sudden all that, you know, but eh, I don't know what to think. And obviously because of the way that I have been, my name has been bandied about in the press of late. I'm not going to make any judgments on anybody, but it, it, what is the action? Has anybody said the actual story? Yes. Several has, people. What is the actual story? And apparently there's more than one. So let me give you a little bit of a recap from the best I've been able to put things together. Tessa Blanchard tweeted out yesterday, as we're recording, at 11.47 a.m., hey, women, try supporting one another. Cool things happen. And then various people, here's Priscilla Kelly. Remember publicly... Oh, wait, 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 now, wait a minute. This is the woman that, that shoved her allegedly used tampon in somebody else's face, isn't it? That is certainly one of her gimmicks. 
Okay, let's just remind let's just remind everybody of that. Now let's see what she has to say. Remember publicly putting me down on Twitter last year for something that didn't involve you whatsoever, then continuing to drag my name to other people for it? Pepperidge Farm remembers. I should- wonder was that the incident? I don't know. Uh, you should probably delete this tweet. And then as another reply, Chelsea Green. Do you know Chelsea Green? I, uh, she, was she in TNA when I did a week down there a while back? I actually, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with who she is. Uh, you've consistently put down, bullied, and belittled countless female coworkers, including me. Is that support? Do you know Allison K? Allison K is currently the NWA Women's Champion. Remember when you spat in a black woman's face and called her the N-word in Japan? Was that you supporting women? The audacity of this tweet. Uh, I love it when people use audacity. There no, is- that, that's where I was going with this. What is? Has anybody issued the story on that incident? It, it, there's a wide context, people. There's a wide disparity, d- disparity between... I just walked up to this woman in the locker room because she she said some sideways shit and spit in her face and called her the N-word, or had they just had a match where this particular woman had possibly dropped her on her head or fucking potatoed her in some kind of way, in which case, yes, that is fucking understandable and often happens. So which one is it? Well, here's the actual person, apparently, that this instance happened to, because, again, a lot of these stories aren't even about that. It's about things that have happened to them, bullying to them. This is, uh, and it appears there's a little bit of a language barrier here because it's not perfect English. Uh, Puerto Rican wrestler La Black Rose, uh, I, I think that's the name here. Again, I'm not familiar with her. That story, yes, that happened in Japan. I- I'm translating as best I can. That happened in Japan, 2017. Tessa Blanchard does not remember. I can. I am not a mean girl with any coworkers around the world. Uh, be kind of racist is not ridiculous. It is a sickness. Again, it's a little bit of a language barrier. And then I see here lots of other people. I mean, it seems like every woman wrestler that's not <laughs> working an impact. Well, here's Isla Dawn. Isla Dawn. I don't know who this is. As someone who experienced your bullying firsthand, received regular verbal abuse, was spat on, had rumors spread about me dealt with multiple attempts by you to blacklist me from other companies, plus more. I just pray you now follow your own advice. And it's just one tweet after another. I mean, it seems like there's now countless people coming out and saying this. And well, thank you, Tessa. You've taken the heat off of me. (laughs) (laughs) When I have met her several times and can't think of a more polite or delightful person to talk to. And I, as I said, I don't watch her on impact because I love her, her, what I've seen of her work, but I'm not going to go that far to watch that fucking show. Um, but uh, the few times that I've seen her, she's been an incredible fucking talent and what intensity. And she works like a guy, which is the ultimate compliment. And uh, and she's been nice and polite and bubbly. And uh, I don't know what to think. Do you know a wrestler named Rebel? Uh, 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 no, a uh, uh, Rebel from TNA. Uh, well, yes, yes. I like to think yes. people change over time, but I can confirm the bad behavior and non-supportive attitude in Japan. I was there. <laughs> Here's Shayna, who's now with AEW. She did more nasty stuff in Japan. <laughs> Never forget. Oh, Practice what you preach, sweetheart. What I the- stand by uh, the uh, Ab- Abusa Dorte PR. That's the wrestler who allegedly had uh, the N-word thrown at her and was spit in her face. She's a fun-loving person who would never disrespect anyone. Much love to you, Rosa. Well, <laughs> here's, yeah, Allison maybe- K. here's Allison K again. The reason I've never said anything until now is because it wasn't my story to tell. I made it clear to La Rosa that I had her back, and today was the day she gave me permission. You can't force someone to come forward, but you can be there for them. That is supporting women. So that's her reason for not talking about this beforehand. Here's well, here's uh, someone supporting. Well, God damn. Well, you know, T- Tully never had this much heat in the locker room. <laughs> well, sure he did. It's just there wasn't Twitter. Uh, here's a well, goddamn, you know, yeah, I guess you are right. Yeah. I'm waiting for Manny Fernandez to chime in here, but here's uh, <laughs> someone defending Tessa 
Daga. Oh, what a perfect time to tweet about a woman that is about to make history. Jealous is a real thing. By the way, I'm the Mexican fiance. So apparently that's Tessa's fiance, Daga. He's well, I, well and, and also there is an element of, I mean, she's so much better than the other girls. <laughs> you know, there could be, the, there could be that as well, but holy shit. And you would obviously yeah, admit she, that it would... she got Tully's people skills. She really did. Well, yeah. And again, you say she was always nice and kind to you. I would have to think that the way she treats someone like you would be different than other coworkers in the same division. And yeah, I yeah. mean, it's one after another, after another, and she's wrestling, you know, my theory is always, if you end up an impact, there's probably a reason you end up an impact. It's wrestling purgatory. Yeah, a, you know it's a place to kind of repair yourself, and she's not in WWE, she's not in AEW. Apparently, a lot of these stories, even though they're now publicly coming out, have been whispered about. Do you do anything different if you're Impact Wrestling, where she's allegedly in line? As we're recording today, it may happen later today on pay per view. Who knew they still had pay per views? She's in line to win their World's Heavyweight Championship from Sammy Callahan. Do you do anything differently just because she's insulted every girl wrestler in the business? No. What the fuck? Of course not. If she, if you may have trouble, uh, trouble finding people to work with her, or elsewise those matches could be stiff and interesting. Uh, but if she, but it, it, no, and just because once again somebody called someone a name while they potentially were in a fight with them, I can identify with that. If uh, if she walked up. What if they weren't, the, though? What if they weren't well, in a fight? Well, if they weren't, then then that is a bit strong, and I think she owes the girl an apology. But if they were in some type of issue over the match or a, a fucking physical altercation or whatever the fuck, then we need more information on that. But otherwise, no, just because she's been a bully and or snidely uh, to all of the other girls that she's worked with is no reason to change her push if, if you're happy with her in your company, for fuck's sake. And once again, this is not only not ballet, but it's not fucking romper room. If everybody's getting their feelings hurt, maybe there's too many people with soft feelings and fucking wrestling. Or maybe it's Tessa. Be, or maybe be, the problem is Tessa. Well, no, well, and maybe the problem is Tessa. As I said, if she's insulted and pissed off every girl, and as long as you're happy with her in your company and can find people to work with her, that ain't your fucking problem. You're not hiring nice people. You're hiring talent. I come from an era when the, the booker could more or less fucking smack you if he wanted to, and you were either going to fight him and get fired or fucking take it. So I'm not, I'm hard to fucking impress with he, she hurt my feelings and bullied me. Well, then fucking knock her out. What you, the fuck? If you're going to be wrestlers, be wrestlers. If a guy was that upset in a locker room at something that somebody had said or done to them, they would fucking... It'd do one thing or the other. They'd either not do anything about it or they would. So either don't do anything about it or do. Well, don't this... fucking say, well, she's so mean that you shouldn't use her in a company I don't even work for. Well, no one's it's saying fucking that, ridiculous. Though. But no one's saying that. And again, she brought this on herself by tweeting out, hey, women, try supporting one another. <laughs> cool things happen. I mean... Maybe, maybe 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 the right word there for that tweet. You know what? That's that's probably that that she could have got to if Twitter was around in 1984. That could have been said by Tully Blanchard or Gino Hernandez. It would have been great. I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, yeah, that that. Uh, well, hey, it's maybe she's trying to be positive now. It's a new year. She's like me. She slept some. She decided she wants to be positive now. Like Sheik, that time he was positive. When they started the drug test, and he turned up positive. They call him Sheik, you're positive. Oh, I knew I had to be positive. Yes, Sheik always positive. She's trying to be positive. Was it one of the stories that he was like, was Don Morocco positive? Was Jake Roberts positive? I was with them. (laughs) (laughs) That's after he found out positive was a bad thing. You know, um, obviously Tully had his issues with people. Maybe to this day still has some people skills issues. I've never heard a bad thing about Joe Blanchard ever. Have you? No, he was. I wasn't around him a ton. We worked, you know, the the towns because he ran, uh, obviously San Antonio and South Texas for so long. We worked some of his towns, and I obviously met him, but I never had a problem with him. He he always seemed to be cheerful. Nobody I I recall ever saying anything bad about him. I you know Tully had an element of 
You know, rich kid, star's son, promoter's son, high school football star, college football, you know, fucking that whole thing. And he just, his, his personality was what came over on television. He was kind of like if MJF really meant, and he probably does at this point because he's so good, but if he was saying, I'm better than you and you know it and really meant it and looked like Tully when he said it with that shit sniffing look Tully used to get where he'd look at somebody just like, I can't believe you're breathing my air. Holy fuck. You want to take a swing at him, Tully, just fucking, you know, just that expression. And you'd get that in the locker room. Uh, so yeah, but that's what made him think about that. Tully was a normal sized guy. Uh, he was, he didn't have an incredible physique. He wasn't incredibly sizable. He didn't do anything spectacular in the ring, like a Bobby Eaton or whatever, but he was a main event guy because he had the personality and he knew how to work and he knew how to put the match together and had psychology. And he was like a little fucking just an, an an annoying fucking nappy dog that would stay on you and grind you down and wear you down or whatever. He had that, that quick way of working and, uh, and it was legitimate and believable. He came off like just a regular fucking high school jock football asshole and a rich kids fucking, you know, snotty, greedy, just, he was a, a, a heel that everybody could relate to. It wasn't like, you know, the, the Sheik got heat, but nobody in real life knew a fucking guy like the Sheik. But everybody had seen or met or gone to school with or just been around somebody like Tully. Looking through some more tweets here. Here's Renee Michelle oh, from Good God, Beautiful <laughs> Woman in the WWE. Apparently, she had an issue with Tessa. Apparently, there's a video. I don't know the backstory, but. I'm st- when I'm starting now to feel like fuck. I'm ashamed to be in the. I, I like uh, t- I'm Tully and Magnum and poor Tessa. I'm I'm being a party to this. I don't know anything about this. What the fuck? Diona is it? Diona Perazzo is that her name? She's one of Rip Rogers' young proteges. Here's an incident where I guess I'm reading between the lines. I don't know the whole story. Someone correct me. During a battle royal, there was an incident with Tessa, and she got fed up, and she slapped Tessa in the face, and they started fighting. God damn it. Um, well, here's apparently I'm reading through this kind of quickly. <laughs> this is slightly off topic. Apparently there is something, you know, a lot of these women wrestlers nowadays, I guess to make some extra money, they do Patreon. And unlike, you know, if we did Patreon, we would have audio content or potentially video content. They do exclusive photos, you know, bikini shots, whatever it may be. I guess this kind of falls in line with that. I guess if I am to believe what I'm reading here, she took a dump for a fan. What? There's audio of it. I don't know if there's video of it as well. What? (laughs) What What are you trying? I'm trying to say that it appears that... How do you... That audio of a dump... Well, I guess there could be, but but would you really want audio of a, I don't, what? We're not playing this on the show, I will say that, but apparently. Well, is this copyrighted? I I, I don't. Is it copyrighted? I mean, can we call Stephen P. New? I don't believe it's copyrighted. Um, Well, then let that baby fire. Uh, so to speak well hold on let me find the, the actual audio here i'm reading about it let me get the audio uh if you want well, it pan- seems like we should have some more fucking preparation going on here if you're going to malign somebody i was trying to defend until now there's recordings of her being fucking princess pooping house well, what while, the fuck? while i'm looking to see if this audio is indeed here what are your thoughts on female wrestlers doing Audio like, of themselves taking a well, shit. Beyond, I'm high. I'm, beyond the defecation in terms of like modern apartment house wrestling. What and, is the definition of defecation? <laughs> Do you, does it have to, can it just be crowning? Can it just be peeping as Arn Anderson, Arn Anderson used to say, whenever Arn had to take a shit, he'd say, can you hurry up and get to the store? I got one peeping. Um, But it, I, I, as far as... Uh, 
the custom video thing. I I've heard that that people have custom wrestling videos. I I don't know I, because to me if that falls into the category of kind of making the business be fake. So I wouldn't be really in favor of that unless it was an actual video of a pro match in front of people. In which case I would be for that. I I don't. I, why are you asking me these things? This is a hot button issue. I did find, here's a tweet from Tessa defending herself. Well, yes, let's get something from Tessa's point of view around here. Replying to Chelsea Green again, what Chelsea said was you've consistently put down, bullied, and belittled countless female employees, uh, co-workers, excuse me, including myself. Is that support? Tessa responded, I've never been anything but kind to you. I've dealt with mean girls since I started. Not saying I'm a saint. Son of a bitch. Hold on. <laughs> Or a son of a bitch. Someone from the wrestling business, too. They always got to fucking bother me. Not saying I'm a saint. Hell, I've had my ups and downs, and I've made silly decisions. Such is life. You have zero merit in your comments. Instead, putting me down here for a little clout, you've got my number. There you go. All right. A denial. A denial. And call me up. Uh, hold on. Here's someone. Here's Travis Heckle actually commenting on Twitter. Someone said this audio or video of her shitting on a fan. What? what now, wait. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Just back the fuck up. No. No. Now, this is how that shit. No, I'm not going to be a party. That, but just 10 minutes ago, it was like there was an audio tape of her farting in somebody's face. And now there's video of her shitting on a fan on fucking Broadway. No, I refuse to believe all this horse shit. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting until there is more goddamn evidence come in on, on all of this stuff. Here's some commentary about... <laughs> What the fuck? William Bozard in the Mothership Group. I heard a couple minutes of it. It was definitely going in the toilet because you could hear an occasional splash. Well, wait a minute. If you hear a a recording of somebody taking a shit, how do you, how do you pinpoint who that person is? Do is it like fingerprints? Does everybody shit sound alike? Oh, well, wait, I'd know that sound anywhere. That's Tessa taking that dump. What the fuck? Well, the other question is, if there really is video of it, did someone say, you know what? I need to capture the audio. Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we don't want to show that video, but we need to get that audio out to the people. They need to know about this. This, this, if, pardon the pun, this whole story stinks, in my opinion. All right, your future Impact champion, Tessa Blanchard. Well, she better watch out for Callahan, though, because he likes to fucking ask people to work with him and then gets mad at him without telling him. Do you want me to keep looking for this audio or do you want me to not play this? Well, I, well but, but I mean, here's the thing. Once again, now that I've said that out loud, hey, if you play, I've got a goddamn cassette recording of, 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 of a ridiculously offensive sounding shit that I bought. It's a commercial recording that I bought years ago. It's entitled The Big Shit. Got it at a truck stop. What? And yeah, it's a cassette recording, and it's got a picture of a toilet on it. It's, it's titled The Big Shit, and it's just this guy taking his horrible sounding shit for like minutes and minutes. And I don't know who that guy is. I've heard him, because I used to have it in the car. I used to play it for the boys. I've heard him shit 30, 40 times easily. But if I was standing right next to him in the, in the middle of a Wendy's, I wouldn't know it was him because... You can't identify someone from the, so how is someone to say this is an audio of Tessa Blanchard or anybody else taking a shit, unless a, a voice authorization has been given, like, hi, everybody, this is Tessa Blanchard, and the shit you're about to listen to is mine. <laughs> And then, and then you can run that through one of those voice authorization things, because, you know, people would try to, well, it's like this one guy, I know sold something one time that he wasn't supposed to have, right? For a lot of money and cash and shoe boxes. And before he he turned that item over, he also had the people that purchased it sign a, a, a handwritten document that he had filled out that said, I certify that I did not get such and such item from so and so. And then they signed it. So he was covered, right? You can't identify. A, a, a shit is all I'm saying. 
So we will not be playing this audio. Well, let's play the audio. Okay, hold on. I'm reading. We just can't. We just can't attribute it to one single human being. There's no evidence. Uh, I can't wait. But this this may be. This may be the big shit. The the tape that I've had for so many years. Maybe somebody's pawned that off again. But now this time they're saying it's it's a famous wrestling personality. All right, hold on. I'm pressing play. There's some noise happening. Now, this is a very somber situation. Would you shut up? But it was a voice. Wait, wait, back up, back up. What was that? I see you. You're watching me take a shit. <laughs> you like it? <laughs> oh, you fucking bastard. Ew, huh? You like to hear... You like to hear that? You think that's gross? You fucking find that a turn on, don't you? Oh. Mm, you like... Dirty girls like to shit on toilets, huh? <laughs> That's making me hard, isn't it? Oh, you want a like, real piece of that action, don't you? I'm not worried about copyright now. I'm worried about Excuse fucking me. the FCC. <laughs> Is this the tape you got? Uh, no, it doesn't sound like that guy. I thought he was a truck driver. Can you identify this voice? Well, no, I've never listened to Tessa. Like, your dick's probably super hard right now, isn't it? Oh. You're probably, like, rubbing your balls or your cock and, like, it's going all, ooh, yeah, every time I take a big, nice dump, you know. Uh-huh. Oh. I don't think we're going to be able to put this on YouTube. <laughs> Watching a sexy hot girl take a dirty, nasty, disgusting dump. Oh, having diarrhea. What the? F- oh. Where did this come from? Who released this? This was, uh, Posted online. <laughs> Jim, a situation like this, you think she should go to the finish, or do you think they should draw it out? I, I'm pretty. Go home. Go, home. Mr. Coffee, with his tie and toilet paper is just. Do you want me to fast forward? It's longer. You like to peek in on girls with your little counter spying on me. How long have you been watching me? Oh, I wonder how many times you've watched me take a shit and a dump. All those times I come in here and they don't think I'm no one sees me. I'm gonna fast forward. You probably like. I wish you would. Shit. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, you just want to put it all in your hand and use the jack off, huh? Like jack off, you want to shit oh, all your hand? Oh. Like, oh. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> Maybe I'll put them in a baggie for you and, like, mail it so you can, like, put your hand, like, your dick in a bag and, like, use it to jack it off with. Like, oh, what? And then I'll to your video while you watch me take it down. <laughs> oh. Where's she been, P.F. Changs? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Well, that shit had to be at least 80 Curex. Oh. I'm you get up that quickly. I'm not going to let you see that shit. <laughs> this is still pretty dirty. I think you should... You want to fucking see what that shit looks like, don't you? And you come here and fucking lick it off for a bitch. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. Is the person actually there? I don't think so. I think she's making a video. Whoever this allegedly is. <laughs> All right, I'm going back to my stuff that I was doing. I guess I'll see you soon because I should. <laughs> oh! Oh, there's the finish. 
Well, that's the um, the end of the audio. The audio is almost six minutes long. Seven farts. <sighs> Can we air that? I had no idea when we started this bit because this was obviously not rehearsed. And I, I have no idea now what to do with this. <laughs> not exactly sure, but... Um... <laughs> Should we call Stephen P. New and let him hear it? I will double check with Stephen to make sure, because we're not exactly sure who this is. It's been alleged. Well, no, but, but, but once again, I don't, I I don't know what Tessa Blanchard's voice sounds like in when she's in the middle of that type of situation. So I cannot, you know, uh, that's, I, but that uh, if somebody's. <laughs> If somebody's putting that out, it's pretty low. It's pretty damn shitty for somebody to put that out and attach her name to it. If that isn't her, and if that's her, it's pretty damn shitty for her to have put that out. How much would you pay for a thing like that? I would pay zero. No, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the royal you. How much would a member of the royal family pay for? No, I'm. How much would just? How much would that be? I don't know. Well, I would have to think if you're someone who's supporting female wrestling by paying for bonus content, this would be high on the list. This would be like the thousand dollar tier. I would think I would, I would, I would think, I don't know. I really don't know. I, <laughs> we've reached a new low, a new depth. <laughs> you know, this I don't, we have absolutely no finish for this bit. It took a disturbing turn and I was all ready to, to just defend everything, but now I don't. I don't know. I don't know. All I right. Don't... Well, let's uh, move on to another topic. <laughs> Do you think we really should run it by Stephen to make sure? We... I, I think <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it up to him uh, after the show when I have yeah, to talk right. with him. But take take two. This okay. It, it, by the way, if you don't hear that audio here, there's a reason for it. Yeah, Le folks, if you didn't hear what we just said, then there's a reason for that, but you won't ever know what it was. Speaking of wrestlers on Twitter, our next question was sent in to corny drive through at gmail.com from Brett Perry in Fremont, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> it only gets better from here. Hey, Fremont. Hello. Hey, Jim. Just hey, what? Fremont. Just wonder. <laughs> I just can't. I can't do the rest of the show. Just wondering if you caught CM Punk's controversial tweet from Tuesday night and whether you think it was a genuine reaction or just the old CM Punk working fans for his amusement. No, I, I think it was a normal guy who took offense to something a whole loud mouth said on a show that he's going to be on soon. Hey, go suck a blood covered dick in Saudi Arabia. You blood money covered dick in Saudi Arabia. You fucking dork. That's, that's exactly what CM Punk would say. I'm proud of him for saying it. Oh. <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> Well, that's it. You, you know, you've got to admit he's got a way of turning a phrase. Hey, you know what? I'm sorry, but goddamn, in, in my world, when I was born, when I was around in life, in public, if you said something to a motherfucker, a motherfucker may say something back to you. And it goes on that way. And everybody's too goddamn sensitive. As Dennis Condry used to say, either get it on or get along, one or the other. Do you think they're building up to anything, or do you think it's just... No, I think he pissed him off, and he just said, Hey, you fucking dork, go suck a blood money-covered fucking dick. All right. Any any other comments about this? <laughs> I think he pretty much shut him down with that one. <sighs> All right, let me find another question. I didn't expect to go through that one so quickly. Well, the, well I mean... What... <sighs> What else is there to say? Now, Miz, Miz can either e escalate or de-escalate. He can either say nothing or I'm sorry, or he can say, hey, fuck you, motherfucker. Here's where I'll be at 5 o'clock on Tuesday. Well, what do, you think about the he is. what do you think about the idea of it escalating so far so quickly? Miz made a comment, a rather flippant comment, apparently, about changing the locker room culture, which was a shot at Punk, although somewhat subtle. And Punk immediately went to 
go suck a blood money dick or whatever he said. Well, well, now we don't know if there's been if there's been un, uh, uh, groundwork laid on this. We don't know if there's ill will or if there's been words exchanged or just a general feeling of miscontent among these two individuals before. And we also don't know what particular mood punk was when he fucking heard that. Because sometimes I hear things and I'm in a particular mood and I I write back, you know, I'll just goddamn snatch you around the neck, you piece of shit, because I've always fucking disliked you. And other times I may just go, you know what, one of these days I'll just kick him in the fucking shins. It just depends on what mood you're in. Do you think the Miz has to say something or do something in return? I, I, well, I think he better not because to be quite honest, I mean, you know, even though Punk's undefe- undefeated, Punk's uh, unwin, un- has an unwin streak in the UFC, at least he's fought in the UFC. And I don't know that Miz has fought with anything except his goddamn tendency to be shitty. So I, I'm saying, you know, eh, Everybody says, why don't you like The Miz? He's like an old school heel. I'm like, every time I I saw him that time, there was The Rock, there was Stone Cold Steve Austin, and there was The Miz in the middle of the ring on Monday Night Raw. And I couldn't help but think, everybody who's been in a fucking coma for the past 10 years is going, who is that small child in the ring with Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock? He's a guy that plays wrestler. He's not a fucking wrestler. Well, he's not that small. He's probably bigger than Punk. Well, yeah, but Punk's also trained for the UFC, and Miz is trained for Hollywood. He's always he's always on reality TV, and he wants to be a TV star. He got into fucking wrestling because he wanted to be on TV. Fuck him. Feed him fish heads. I say Punk would put a sandwich on his back and starve him to death. He'd pull his fucking eyeballs out, shove them up his ass so he could get a good look at what his dinner looked like from last night. There are some people that think Punk may not like him because the Miz got the main event WrestleMania, and Punk never did. Any thoughts on that? Um, the best line I've ever heard anybody utter in a backstage finish meeting was, Hey, motherfucker, I don't have to work with you. You got to work with me. When Punk told that to Triple H. That was an amazing line to deliver to Triple H, I have to say. But our next question, Jim. Another yes. Hot button yes. issue. We're, 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 if anybody out there is still listening, even if we're still on the internet at this point in the show. This one was sent in by our old friend Charlie in Starkville, Mississippi. Oh, I knew it was coming. All right. The Boy, I'll tell you what. Do you have Do you have audio of Charlie? I guess it worked the other way around. Charlie's got audio of you taking a shit. That's why he gets a question on every week. I it's prom- blackmail. I promise you there's no audio. Or brown and mail. You know, what, what, can, what can Brown do for you? Another fine product from Uranus. This is certainly the worst episode we've ever done. This question from Charlie... Hey, Jim. Actually, hi, Jim, if I'm going to be correct here. Hi, Jim. AEW fans are speculating that you are indeed the secret leader of the Dark Order. Oh, good God. They have pointed out that there was a tennis racket in the background of their last video, and in one segment, a pair of Jim Cornette-style glasses was thrown at Evil Uno. What do you think about (laughs) the AEW fans thinking you could be the leader of the Dark Order? Well, I understand they're leading them to think that because they they want people to watch the program and they want to get some attention on themselves. And the way to do that is to latch on to somebody that people pay attention to what they say and what they do, and that's me. So, yes, I understand where they're trying to lead people on with that to get the heat on the leader of their heel group. But uh, I mean, you will know when I'm the leader of the dork order or the dork odor, on All Elite Wrestling because my first act as leader will be to fire every single one in the group, including uh, Fat Uno. Did you see the video where they had the tennis racket? Yes, it was very artfully placed right down in the bottom corner, and the glasses thing was a nice touch, except I would never throw my glasses at anybody. How the What stupid... who Who throws their glasses at somebody, right? For one thing... Then you wouldn't be able to see them. And if you're about to get in a fight with them, you want to be able to see them. Secondly, I want to be able to see after they leave my office. So I wouldn't throw my glasses at them because it wouldn't hurt them. I would pick up a a heavy, like, ashtray or desk lamp or fucking phone set or something, and I'd chuck that at their fucking head. 
Sort of like the goddamn big collection of fucking change that I chucked at the fucking head of the uh, guy running the convenience store when he mouthed off at me because he had sold Stacy some ruined mayonnaise that ruined the potato salad when we were about to have dinner and then didn't want to give me my money back. Well, that's another story. But anyway, the fucking thing <laughs> is... What are you laughing at? I'm t- I haven't heard this story, but the ruined mayonnaise. Well, it was, it was no, it was ruined potato salad coming from the spoiled mayonnaise. It ruined the whole goddamn thing. But anyway, um, yes, they're trying to make people think it's me. And no, it's not, because the first thing I would do is fire every single one of them. But I understand why they're trying to do that, because they want to latch some popularity off of a, a popular personality such as myself. And Lord knows... We do fine programming here with with audio tapes of people taking shits and other fine forms of programming that you won't hear anywhere else. But I bet this will be the only time that you hear that on a podcast. And you might not even have heard it. That's what it was. If you didn't hear it, it was audio of somebody taking a shit in a very sexual way. <laughs> I think we could actually we can we can air the shit stuff, but I'm worried about all the talk of the hard dick and the and the dick in the sh- in the hand and the shit and the pudding and the and the bag and the bag and the bag the shit in the bag. Maybe she said she maybe I'll just send you the bag so you can stick your dick in the bag of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, that's calling it in the ring, boy. Oh, boy. I'm sure that wasn't gone over in the fucking finish meeting. That was that was all off the top of the head called in the ring. You know, Why this, are we back on this thing now? Because you brought it back up. It. You did this. Well, this we might fault. not. We might not even have played it. So then, the p- folks won't know what we're talking about. Do you think the Jimmy Valiant rumor is true? No. On this topic of, of no. defecation. No, that's ridiculous. Handsome's not going to go to all the trouble and get down the middle of the floor and lay under a fucking table for anybody. Our next question, continuing on the topic of wrestlers and Twitter. But now Klondike Bill, that was his specialty, which is actually where it came from. It was just the story was updated and modified for a, a, a more modern-day Crockett personality. So Klond- Klondike Bill, in addition to having the NWA World Pussy Eating Championship belt, and uh, was also the champion of hotel maids. And back in the days where it wasn't the chain hotels and everybody was scared for their job, but it was the local mom and pop roadside motels and whoever the maid was, was generally amenable to just about anything. Klondike bill was the champion and glass tabletops. Okay. Well, our next question, continuing on the topic of wrestlers misbehaving on Twitter. I should tell you this story that, that old Wally Dusick told me in Charlotte, North Carolina one night about when he was in Alaska during the gold rush days of like the 1920s story of this hooker he he paid her in a gold piece and then tried to get it back from where she had secreted it without her knowing about it but ended up coming out with a scab instead of a coin it was a it was a horrible story it took a while to tell well i thought we had reached our low <laughs> about 20 minutes ago but that kind of shit happened back in the 1920s in the pioneer days of wrestling well speaking of pioneers our next question was sent in to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com. There is no name attached here, but there is a tweet attached. Uh, I'll read the question first. Dear Jim, I was looking into this week's wrestling news and came across this tweet from Kenny Omega yeah. regarding the AEW women's division. Yeah. I'm a person pulling for the success of AEW, but I can't stand this guy any longer. We reject the shit product he gives us, and in doing so, we become, quote, ignorant and classless. Any thoughts on this? And I'll read you the tweet, Jim. Oh, well, yes, because I, I need that information there. Kenny, I guess, did a Q&A on Twitter, taking questions from various fans, and one of them, Rob, wrote, what do you think of the criticisms of the women's division? And Kenny replied, lately, most criticisms, in quotes, I read are incredibly ignorant depressing the amount of fans that have absolutely no class. That being said, I do try to sift through them to get to actual <clears throat> constructive criticism. So any thoughts on Kenny saying that the criticisms of the women's division have no class? Or the well, criticizers, I guess. The criticizers, yes. 
Well, here's the, he's sifting through the comments trying to get something constructive, and the reason why it's taking him so long to sift through is because you can't be constructive when you haven't got anything to work with because he's buried the women that you might be able to work with in the p- process of pushing his fetishistic fucking view of Japanese schoolgirls as major pay-per-view box office attractions and when you have a scared to death looking 98 pound looks like you know she facially she looks she's only what 23 or whatever she looks like she's 40 facially because she's always got that scared look on her face like woo and that 98 pound schoolgirl has beaten your 300 pound giant and your american doctor and everybody else they've and the, your space alien and everybody else that uh, you've paraded out in front of her. So, yeah, I would say it takes you a while to shift shift through for some constructive comments when nobody, including fucking Eddie Graham or goddamn Jack Pfeffer, for that matter, could fucking make anything out of the mess of a division that you have for your women. Because you, Mr. Olivier, are a fucking moron. And that's basically the brand. And everybody keeps saying, why isn't Kenny Omega the same as... When we saw him in Japan. I wish they'd book him like they did in Japan. That's because in Japan, he did as he was told, and smart people who run New Japan Pro Wrestling told him what to do. And then the major talent in the ring, like Okada and Tanahashi and all those guys, fucking told him what to do, or at least didn't let him do the things that he would do if he was left to his own devices. And what you see in all elite wrestling is when left to his own devices. He's a fucking simpering, prissy prancing, finger pointing, jazz handsing, face making, silly fuck who wants to have matches that look like video games, has no idea how to get over, has no idea how to fight. His fights look like shit because he's apparently never been in one. He doesn't ha- know how to project any type of toughness <clears throat> for the average wrestling fan or just average mainstream person to say well there's a fucking hero no he's a fucking twit and he likes to play video games and talk about japanese anime fuck jesus h christ what else could be wrong with this guy what gets over in japan doesn't get over here they're very quirky with some of their things in japan and quirky doesn't work in at least that manner of quirky doesn't work over here They have given nobody reason to like Kenny Omega, to think that he's tough, to think that he's a... Have you heard a great Kenny Omega promo? Have you heard him speak in front of the people live, practically? Or just emote his fucking goofy faces like Harpo Marx on fucking meth? Nobody believes he's a kick-ass. Nobody believes he's tough. No man wants to be like him. What was it that the preacher said at... At Nancy Caldwell's funeral in in East Tennessee that we were just talking about several years ago when talking about her husband, Whitey, he was the same age. He said every man in East Tennessee wanted to be Whitey Caldwell. What man wants to be Kenny Omega? He's not a top main event star. He's not a superhero. He's not tough. He doesn't do a great promo. He does silly, shitty matches with a lot of gesticulating that look like video games and people who like Japanese wrestling like that. Well, some people like to have their nail, balls nailed to a step stool, and as we have heard rumors of, some people like to listen to people take shits. Somebody likes everything, but Kenny Omega is not a United States of America main event, pay-per-view, box office attraction, professional wrestling star, and somebody changed my mind. And if he becomes that, I will admit it. Well, two things coming out of that. One, when you say he's not over, he's over with their fan base. You'll at least admit to that. Well, yes, like I said, somebody likes anything. Right, as we've just proven. So if something is over with somebody. I'm talking about mainstream, major attraction, main event level, like the other names you talk about. When you're, That's what has been so insulting to me when I look at this fucking clown's fucking phony matches. The greatest wrestler in the world, some people call him. For fuck's sake. 
shut up. Ric Flair, Steve Austin, fucking Kenny Omega. It'd be the same thing as looking at the Miz standing in the ring with the fucking rock and stone cold. Who's this child except at least Kenny Olivier is more uh, physically appealing. Maybe he should be a ballet dancer. He's got a wonderful physique, right? Or a trapeze artist. Or maybe he could do, you know, the fucking Mikado or whatever. That's that's his speed. But as a professional wrestler, what the fuck? And as a booker, what the fuck? Well, <laughs> He the uh, here's the reason why uh, Kenny Omega will never ever successfully book anything except a table for dinner because he started in the business and he grew up in the business wanting to put on performances instead of being real. The exact antithesis of the mindset you need to have to be a successful booker because the booker's goal, the booker's job, the booker's aspiration is to come up with an angle that people will actually believe and that will sell tickets. When you've already established yourself as just a phony clown show bullshit artist, you can't think like that. So Kenny Omega will never be able to book anything. If you were Tony Khan, would you be upset? I mean, you spent money. If I was Tony Khan, I'd be in fucking Hawaii. I would have Castle Cornet airlifted to fucking Kauai, and none of you would ever see or hear of me ever again. Hey, I hear you. If I was Tony Khan, I'd own the New York Mets. But if you were Tony Khan in this situation, and Kenny Omega was one of the main guys that you signed for AEW, would you be upset with the way he apparently wants to be used. And the fact that he got a haircut, the fact that he doesn't seem to have the charisma that he had in Japan, the fact that you're not getting the new, Oh yeah, Japan I forgot, forgot about the hair, forgot about the hair too. At least he looks like, that's probably because everybody was tweeting out the Harpo Marx pictures. Um, but you're not getting the new Japan, no. Kenny Omega. If you're Tony Khan, if you're the guy hiring him, are you upset about that? No, I would be upset at myself because I was stupid enough to fall for a smoke and mirrors presentation that had made a guy a star in one fucking atmosphere and in one culture that could not translate anywhere else when left to his own devices. I would be mad at myself. I would be mad at myself for the people that I chose to go in business with, even though I'm sure a number of people told him, what the fuck are you doing? So I'd be mad at myself for hiring someone to do something at the highest level that they have never done before ever. <laughs> now, if I had, if had been one to counsel him, let's just imagine that I said this. I said, yeah, tell the fans that this company is going to care about the wrestlers. Cause that's all the rage these days. That's why that the fucking their shows we talked. We talked about it before. They're all in Drew because it was a the world's biggest crowdfunding effort. People wanted to be a part of something. People wanted. Oh, we're going to support these guys this time. It's not the man. It's not the promoter getting the. The boys are getting the money. The boys are getting the the goods off of this. Well, all of a sudden, the boys have become the man. They're the bosses now. So, how far does this crowdfunding idea work? I would have said. Yeah, tell the people that you're going to listen to the concerns of the wrestlers and put one or two on a board or have a player coach representative or whatever. But don't actually fucking listen to them. Have fucking experienced people in charge of what the fuck and have a vision for what you're going to do. Don't do this indie bullshit with guys that have never been at this level before except for a Cody Rhodes who grew up already having the genetics for that level and obviously understands what the fuck's going on. The rest of the fucking play wrestlers humor them a little bit, but goddamn, don't really make them legitimately one of the, one of the bosses. Fuck. You know, I've heard it said that AEW wouldn't have happened if Tony Khan wasn't able to sign Cody, the Young Bucks, and Kenny Omega. But now, several months into it, if the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega weren't there, do you think it would hurt AEW? Well, no, because the same people would watch independent wrestling with a big budget as they are now. And that's all they're going to get because a lot of those guys don't know how to get over. Jericho will do what he can and Cody's getting over. 
uh, the, and MJF can talk himself over, but you know, at the same time, if it's not a hot program, just cause you're one of the best things on it doesn't necessarily make you hot. It, it, it would have been best if, if there was a choice of starting all elite wrestling with the young bucks and Kenny Olivier or not starting all elite wrestling, it would have been best for wrestling to not start all elite wrestling. Because they had one crack in this generation at a television network of that magnitude going to take a fucking flyer at wrestling. And that you probably one crack in this generation at a guy with that much money willing to back a wrestling company and that, and those contacts. And it's a shame it was wasted on these fuckers that ain't going to be able to fucking capitalize on it, which has been my problem all along. This is it. This is the chance we had, and they're going to fuck it up because they're outlaw and they don't know what they're doing. And they, they, if, Kenny Olivier got the impression he was a star because he lived in Japan and was in that bubble. And he, I guess, you know, the people that like anime and play video games, there's probably more of them over there in Japan where they started the shit than there is over here in Des Moines. And then the Young Bucks, come on, fucking seriously, give me a goddamn break. It's, a, a, yes, I used to like every so often on Ed Sullivan when he would bring out the fucking guy that spun all the fucking plates. And that was fun as fuck to watch when I was a kid, spinning all those plates. It was amazing. But you know what? As you grow up and you see it a number of times, you realize he's still spinning the same amount of plates in the same place. And that's what the young bucks have been doing since before they were losing their hair was flipping and super kicking around and doing a bunch of phony bullshit to get themselves over at the expense of the business in general. And that's what people are finally seeing now that they're on national TV and expected to hang with the big boys. Who the fuck are these small children playing wrestler on my television? And who have they gotten over on AEW TV? Well, they've put they, over they've a bunch of people. people. They just haven't gotten anybody exactly. over because nobody gives a shit to begin with. Except the people who were already into them. It's enough to make them some money. But it ain't enough start a wrestling promotion off of because people who are actually going to watch pro wrestling in any significant numbers have to fucking either believe in somebody, not the business itself, but somebody on the program, Stone Cold Steve Austin, or even Chris Jericho. But they also have to fucking understand the matches, know who the fucking stars and who the underneath guys are, and they also have to be drawn into the fucking personal issues, which obviously are the thing that draw money in wrestling, rather than all these goddamn flips that they've buried every move, they've killed off every finish. Nobody can ever get over with a fucking athletic move on All Elite Wrestling at this point right now, ever, because they've done them all in the first three months. And that's all they know how to do, because that they're indie fucking wrestlers. And the reason why Cody's getting over is because he's a step above them and he knows what to fucking do. And he looks like a grown adult athlete and he knows how to book himself and he knows how to talk. The rest of them are playing. It's playtime for them. It's a fun, silly business that they play in. And then they go play video games. The goddamn fat mask fucker in dork odor. Somebody sent me a thing where he did a guest column in a video naming his 10 favorite video games. He's, he's middle-aged. I was watching him wrestle 12 years ago in ring of honor. He's got to be in his fucking late thirties. And he's, 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 he's created his gimmick off a of fucking video. It's, it's an entire club of video game players. I E people who never go out in the real world and see what the fuck's going on. Well, that's not every video game player. I play video games. I don't think you could label everyone who plays video games with that. If you play video games to the extent that video game magazines ask you to name your top favorite video games and you have taken a goddamn video game personality and put it into a professional sport of which you are allegedly a professional athlete in, you're too fixated on your fucking video games. I'll agree with that second part. All right. Well, our next question... Another hot button issue. This has been a hot button episode of the gym. <laughs> well, I'm about to press a fucking button over here. The air raid button. Oh, I thought that was the Tessa video. 
But this next question was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from John Schwab in maybe Michigan. Since it blew up on the Wrestling Observer message board and Twitter this week, the subject of Sergeant Slaughter's military career has been a hot button topic. Based on all the information being presented, it appears he was never in the Marine Corps at any point, which may have already been known, but has resurfaced to a large extent this week. My late father served in the Marine Corps, and I guess I never thought to question Sarge's authenticity before. This is a topic that has come up with Manny Fernandez in the past, who was in the Navy, but embellished his career to the point of saying he was a Navy SEAL and served in Vietnam. Well, fuck, I didn't even know he was really in the fucking Navy. But we no. always knew he was bullshit about Vietnam. And, ev- you know, every once in a while on the plane, he'd be playing cards with the boys. and He'd grab his side. And go, Manny, you all right? Yeah, I just got some shrapnel. You know, what the fuck? <laughs> Did Sergeant Slaughter get by with this for so long because he embraced the gimmick 24-7 for the past 30 years and everyone just accepted it? He can make claims that he's always in character and that Robert Remus never claimed military service. But Sergeant Slaughter did. Is this a topic with Sarge that has ever come up in your interactions in the past? And I don't know if you've been following it, Jim, but, and I'm surprised that all of a sudden people are realizing he was never really in the military, but it has become a big issue because I gather he has done interviews where he's talked about training camp and talked about actually being in the military outside of, of the professional wrestling setting. So what are your thoughts on all this? Well, I always thought he was in the Marines. <laughs> I really did. I thought he'd been a Marine before he was a wrestler. <clears throat> um, but, well, but were the uh, were the interviews outside wrestling like last week or were they during the course of his career or whatever? Because he, here's the thing. He looks like, which is probably why the gimmick got over so well. If you were going to th- think of a drill sergeant in the Marines uh, of a professional wrestler, who else would look more like that than Sergeant Slaughter, right? The big chin and the whole nine yards. I assume that that's the gimmick they gave him when they made him Sergeant Slaughter. Where where was he first Sergeant Slaughter? Because he first he was Bob Remus when he first started. That's right. And then for a while he was uh, Super one Destroyer of the Mark Super II. Destroyer Mark II. Uh, what, what year would then, when he went to, when he went to Vince, when, when he, he went to, well, 1980, when he went to the WWF, he was Sergeant Slaughter. He came out, he had the, uh, the music he had, I mean, he had everything. He had the hat, the car. I mean, he really embraced it a hundred percent. Okay. Well, as a matter of fact, in 1996 and seven and eight, when I was living up there and they still had that fucking, his camouflage painted station wagon parked on level two <laughs> of the parking garage, all the tires were flat. It hadn't been anywhere in ages, but it was still there. Um, okay. Vince gave him the gimmick and Vince told him, okay, from now on you're Sergeant Slaughter and you were in the Marines. So that's what he did. And then what are you going to do? I guess after saying that for so many years, you're going to come out and say, no, I really never was. He probably just never, he just left it alone. But I, if part of the gimmick, I thought that fucking he probably had, cause he looks like he should have been in the Marines. Uh, but uh, I'm not upset at it because if he, if he was saying that in the eighties as part of the gimmick, that was what he was supposed to do. And the gimmick's more important than anything. Um, then what's he supposed to do? Call all the fucking papers 25 years later and say, Hey guys, I was just fucking kidding. I really wasn't. So I, you know, I'm not mad at him. I like Sarge. He's a, he's a good guy. Was Tom Pritchard really a doctor? Actually, if you talk to many of the people in the continental locker room at the time, which is what earned him somewhat that nickname. Yes, he was in certain cases, a person who could dispense pharmaceuticals. Well, <laughs> but, it, but I mean, see, that's yes, I get, you know, you could be mad if it was some clown just trying to, to, you know, get in the newspaper for being a fucking war hero or whatever. But no, it, it, a lot of guys had gimmicks that they were not only in the service, but a lot of guys had gimmicks that they were a lot of things they weren't. And you worked that gimmick and that was the most important thing. So I never admitted that. I wasn't rich until long after I'd actually become rich in real life. When was your first game of tennis? 
next week. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I saw a I, 1988 I, news clip of a skinny Jim Cornette. That was the yes. summer you lost all that weight yep. playing tennis. Horrible. Yep. And you know what? That's the first time I had been on a tennis court since I was about 14 years old. Specifically for that, it was WBTV News in uh, WBT3 in, in uh, Charlotte did a two-part feature on me on the 6 o'clock news. So I, I, they found the tennis court. So when you were 14, you played tennis? Um, no, I never actually played it. I just actually, I, I remember that we went over to, who? it was a friend of my cousin's had a house with a tennis court. And I think I tried to play at that point. I would, No, I was even younger than 14. It was even younger than that. No, I've never actually competitively played a game of tennis in my life. Were there any sports that you did enjoy playing when you were younger? Well, no, the sports I enjoyed watching were wrestling and roller derby. And uh, and I I didn't like playing basketball. I just liked shooting basketball because I liked shooting the shot. But, but you know, I was a fucking flat-footed, fucking not very <laughs> athletic white boy. So I wasn't actually going to go out there and play because then I'd look like an idiot. But I loved it. I could I could hit three-pointers from quite a ways away. All right, Jim, our next question was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Gabe in Atlanta. I recently watched a promo you and the Midnights did after capturing both the world and U.S. titles. At the end, a jubilant Jim Cornette attempts to kiss, to shoot kiss David Crockett, yes, yes. who was having none of it, and Corny ends up chasing him around the studio. <laughs> I laughed my ass off, but I do wonder... Was that a planned rib ahead of time, or did it come up in the sperm of the moment? It came up in the sperm of the moment. I just thought, because I'm because now I'm a baby face, right? So I can be nice to everybody. And I look, I caught David Crockett giving me that look, and I was I was gonna do the handsome Jimmy thing where I grab him and give him the kiss on the cheek. And he starts pulling away. Well, when he started pulling away, I still I had that old heel tendency where I didn't want anybody to get one over on me on television. So I was going to get to him. And we wrestled around a little bit for a shoot there for about five or ten seconds. I got, I think I got pretty close. I got some beard, I think, at least. I, <laughs> <all> right. <laughs> Our next question, Jim, was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Kevin in Hazard, Kentucky. Not sure what the date was, but there was a house show in Hazard, Kentucky, sometime during the Jim Hurd years. On this show, I believe the main event was Ric Flair and the Midnight Express against Brian Pillman and the Rock and Roll Express. Yes. It was supposed to be Flair versus Luger, but Luger had, excuse me, Luger was supposedly out with a staph infection. Yep. I remember you mentioning that Flair wanted to work with Pillman, and I immediately recalled this match. I was curious if this could have been the first time they worked together. Also, why the fuck was WCW having shows at a high school gym? Um, well, because that's the state of it by that point. That's what Hurd had done in, in only one year. And as a matter of fact, I was not there. I had a couple of days off. And because they weren't really important shows. So I had a couple of days off and missed the chance because they had to rearrange the card. I would have gone. If I'd have known it was going to be the only time ever that the Midnight Express would team up with Ric Flair in a six-man tag. Uh, but I was not even there for that. But that's what happened because Luger had staff, and they and they, they told me about it afterwards. I'm like, fucking motherfucker. That must have been a fun match. Oh, my God. Can you imagine that? Ric Flair and Bobby Eaton on the same fucking side. And, I mean, even though they were in Hazard, I'm sure they had some fun. Yeah, and the other side, Young Pillman, Ricky Morton, and Robert Gibson. Yeah. In Kentucky. I'm sure that was a yeah. really fun show, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, that's, that's what happened. And, and, uh, just to rearrange the card and give them a main event that was worth it since they had a no show. And I'm trying to, th I think they were in like hazard and, and maybe up in Huntington or someplace, uh, near that. And I just uh, had a couple of days off. I, and <laughs> Yeah, I can't even remember. I may even have had to go shoot something somewhere else or whatever the fuck. I don't know, but I wasn't there. I wasn't even there. Our next, qu <laughs> Our next question was sent <laughs> in the Cordy drive through at gmail.com from Shane McKay. During the 1990s around mid-Georgia, there was a kid working the indie circuit as a manager going by Jim Cornette Jr., complete with tennis racket and loud suits. He also stated that he had your blessing to use the name and gimmick. Always wondered if there was any truth to this. Absolutely 100% fucking none of, of whatsoever. 
Uh, no, I've never heard of Jim Cornette Jr., nor did I ever tell anybody they could be Jim Cornette Jr. As a matter of fact, one time I had to hire an attorney to prove that somebody wasn't Jim Cornette Jr., and I did that too. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know and then that. And they weren't. Not unless that woman in Shreveport had the gestation period of a rhinoceros. It wasn't even close, so... <laughs> That's what I said, too, to a state agency, and they didn't appreciate it. And I didn't give a fuck. Were you in Mid-South when you were served, or were you already moved on to Dallas? No, I'd, I'd, already, I'd already moved on. A couple couple different moves after that. All right. Well, yeah, that, that was uh, – now, it, it works both ways. You can get busted on those paternity suits, but you can also get cleared. Was Stan, I prefer getting cleared. Was Stan cleared in Florida? Wasn't even close. All that time he sweated about it. It wasn't even close. What do you mean it wasn't even close? The, the kid was, what, dark hair? What, what does that mean? It wasn't well, even close. It, it, whatever the fucking test came out, there was no similarity whatsoever. It was just, you know, fucking like me and Russo, just complete opposites. And how long did Stan avoid wrestling in the state of Florida? It was a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, our next question, Jim, was sent in to corny drive through at gmail.com from Owen. I've first seen uh, this is written poorly. He first saw Keith. Well, Lee. Ev everybody can't be Charlie from Starkville. He first saw Keith Lee at a show in Belfast, Ireland, a couple of years ago and was an instant fan of his style. What would you do to make him shine more? I didn't know that Keith Lee had even been in the business long enough to go to Belfast, Ireland. I had, I thought he was an NXT, uh, a product. How long has he been around? He's been around for at least a few years. He was working on indies in various places. I think he worked for Evolve for, for Gabe Sapolsky. Um, no, I love his, I love his physicality. I, I mentioned on the experience here recently, I don't know that I've ever heard him do a promo otherwise than one of the sit down kind of sports like package presentations. I want to see if he could come out and fucking scream and yell and get some mad. He slobbered and get some eyes and look like he wanted to fucking kill somebody like the Hulk. And to go along with that fucking body or whether he can bring it back and just do a happy baby face, <clears throat> excuse me, a happy baby face promo, but off the top of his head and be, uh, you know, uh, fun and uh, whatever. He just, to me, I haven't heard him talk and his facial expressions. I've mentioned this in the matches. Sometimes they're really, they're on, but then sometimes he drops them. And I think it's almost like maybe they've made it part of his gimmick that he's got that kind of like, he just, he has an expression where he's just not having an expression. You know what I'm trying to say? But I want some fucking passion and emotion and anger and violence and threat out of that fucking mean fucker. He looks too clean and too happy a lot. That's the I one, think that's... Yeah, that's the one big negative about NXT is the promos for most guys. Like, Adam Cole can go out there, and I think a lot of it is, even though they're telling him what to say, he moves around. It feels natural. Yeah. And a lot of these other guys, they stand there and they deliver lines. I'd like to see Keith Lee given some bullet points and say, go out there and, and fire up. I'd like to see what happens. Yeah. Because he's really impressive in the ring. If, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, if you could take that kind of physicality and put it with a fucking promo, holy shit. That's, that's main event level material for WrestleMania. Our final question here this week on this banner edition of the drive through. I think it's been a pretty shitty show myself. It certainly has. All pun intended. <laughs> this was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Christopher K. What's the reason for pay-per-views being on Sunday? Seems like Saturday night would be the best night. You know, actually, it comes from, as I recall, in the early days of pay-per-view from thinking that most people don't go out on Sunday night. Therefore, th you don't want to do something that's on television that requires people to stay home on Friday and Saturday night because that's the nights that they go out most of the time. You wanted something where they would be home, which is usually Sunday night because everybody's got to go to work Monday morning or school Monday morning or whatever. That's in a lot of cases the reasons that I heard back 30 years ago when it first got started. Um, of course, now, you know, 
they've killed pay-per-view for wrestling at least. So it doesn't really matter, but everybody does all. And, and then a couple of the early ones were on holidays, regardless of what night it was on. But then uh, WCW fucked that up by moving Starcade. The first year we actually did it on pay-per-view was in 87, but there was almost no clearance. Right. And that was the one from Chicago. Well, in 88, it was from Norfolk, Virginia, but they moved it to the, I think it was, was it the day after Christmas? <laughs> it was some fucking odd day in December instead of Thanksgiving night. And it, it never recovered. So I, you know, I think that's the way it started and it's just kind of become a tradition. If you were running one of the big companies, I know AEW has done their big shows on Saturdays. WWE continues to do them on Sundays. Obviously, viewing habits have changed. People attending live shows have changed. Everything's really changed since 30 years ago. What night would be your night to pick if you had to pick a night to do a big show on pay-per-view? Well, AEW probably does theirs on Saturday night because they want to draw a a decent-looking crowd in the building. And they're still, you know, let's face it, uh, the more shows they do, the more they're going to need the the benefit of a Saturday night. They're not just going to be able to go out there on fucking, as Wednesday is already showing when they ain't filling up a lot of these places. The WWF, they don't care the WWF doesn't anymore. They, they're not even doing a pay-per-view. It's just a big event. So they could do Tuesday at four in the afternoon. It wouldn't make a fuck probably. Um I think Saturday nights always seem like a big live event, but I don't have a problem if you can fill a building up on Sunday and there probably still are more people at home that would either watch on pay-per-view or on the internet. Um, If anybody's watching a goddamn big wrestling show on their fucking phone, I don't know what to tell you about how stupid you are because goddamn, these are not made to watch on fucking screens four inches across. If you can't, Either record it or watch it live at home. What the fuck? You're watching. Who wants to watch Star Wars on a phone screen as big as their fucking palm of their hand? That is the stupidest shit, watching fucking TV on your phone. Anyway, I remember when I had a TV that only had a screen as big as the palm of my hand because that's all I could afford. I'm not going to spend five times as much money on one 40 years later. What was the question? When did you have a pocket TV? No, it actually, here's, I'll tell you exactly when. In 1979, I started going on the road to Evansville and to all of Christine Jarrett's spot shows. In Evansville, my mom sold the gimmicks. I was doing photography. I would also carry the music and play the music for guys that were starting to have entrance music, Lawler and Valiant and a few other guys. And then on the Thursday night spot shows, I was the ring announcer. So I was definitely playing the music. So I got... This It was uh, the size of a briefcase, and it was an all-in-one unit. It had a cassette tape. It had a TV. It had an AM-FM uh, radio receiver. And what I would do, and it, you could also record. It had a microphone jack. So I would take this thing to the matches. I would tape all the interviews with all of the guys for 60-second radio spots on cassette for Christine's upcoming uh, uh, spot shows. And then I'd take those home and I'd edit them into specific individual spot tapes for blah, 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 and label them for the towns and bring them the following day or whatever. I'd usually do that in Evansville. I'd play the music off of the cassette player by holding the PA mic up to the speaker. And then sometime you could play the radio over the same way for the, when the people are coming in. And then after the show on the way home, if my mom was driving it, depending on what part of uh, Kentucky or Indiana we were in, I could even pick up one of Nick's wrestling shows from Bowling Green, Kentucky on Channel 13 on the little portable battery-operated TV with the three-inch screen on the way back home. So I got a ton of use out of that. How much was it? As I recall, in 1979, I think I paid a little over $200, which would probably Not be... Bad. It'd probably be about what six hundred, six fifty today. But you know, they didn't have those things back then regularly. Okay, well, that wraps up another edition of the drive. Aren't route. you glad you asked? I am actually. It's very interesting. You never mentioned that before. That and the Elegante Southern Boys program that never was. We have done all kinds of things on the program today that we have never done before and probably will never do again. Probably never shall. 
Well, this yeah. shitty edition has come to a close. The Jim Cornette Experience debuts on Friday. This week on the show, Stephen P. New in the flesh, plus Bobby Fulton and much, much more wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel, tinyurl.com slash official corny YouTube, or just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. Don't forget the archives available on the Arcadian Vanguard video channel. If there was a question, you wonder if it's been asked before, go there and check it out. It may have been, or perhaps it hasn't been, but find out on YouTube. Of course, you can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts. Also, don't forget, Cornet's Collectibles. You're not going to make it all the way through this. I- I'm already cracking. Cornet's Collectibles at jimcornet.com where you can get burger towels, t-shirts, autograph photos, books, DVDs, restraining orders, and much more with many more items to debut in the weeks and months ahead. Any words about Cornet's Collectibles, Jim? <laughs> no. Once again, jimcornet.com. Don't forget the law office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Or new, or, stop it. Or newlawoffice.com. But until Friday on the experience, we'll see if we can recover from this one. For Jim Cornet, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally ho. Can we air this?